G'day and welcome to another segment of the Build Me A Brewery podcast. My name is Chris Hayton. Really hope you all enjoyed the segment on equipment sourcing. I've had some great feedback from everyone who was tuned in for it, which is awesome to hear. It was a massive eye-opener for me and gave me so much more to think about in regards to brewery layout, types of systems out there, automation to make life easier, and ways to improve efficiencies depending on if it's a two, three, or four-vessel setup. We now move on to our raw materials and ingredient supplier segment. Now, this is where we talk all things malt, hops and yeast and the important considerations on each in regards to building relationships with suppliers, contracts, handling and storage and much more. Our first episode of the segment I chat with Hayden Lockie from Gladfield Malts. Now Hayden has come from a brewing background having worked at Batch Brewing in the inner west as an assistant brewer and then making the jump across to malt sales and supply. Having a graduate certificate in brewing science, Hayden shares with us some great advice on setting up malt contracts, the varying types of malts available on the markets, recipe design, and tools out there that can help fellow brewers when it comes to honing in on their malt flavor profiles for their beers. So we'll kick off part one of the raw materials and ingredient supplier segment with Hayden Lockie from Gladfield Malts. Welcome Hayden to the Build Me Brewery podcast. Thanks for coming on, mate. Oh, thanks very much, Chris. Great to be here. We got in contact late last year and uh, we had a bit of a, a conversation on you know, your role in the industry, being sort of a malt rep uh, or sales rep for Gladfield Malts here in Australia and wanted to get you on the podcast. This will obviously feature part of the uh, raw materials or ingredient suppliers segment where you know we talk about all the important I guess, or key ingredients when it comes to making beer and and what breweries need to, I guess, consider talking about the malt contracts, hop contracts, yeast. So uh, really want to dive into some important considerations when it comes to, you know, all the different malts out there, dealing with maltsters like Gladfield. We'll, I guess, sort of see where it flows and and take it from there. But before we get into the nitty gritty of it all, mate, want to get an understanding of your humble beginnings of how you got to where you are in the industry being at Gladfield I know that you also had a a short stint in the brewing industry before you made the jump and yeah so just tell us a bit about your your craft beer roots and and how you came to be where you are now. Sure well I'm a Kiwi so I grew up in New Zealand and I've always been fascinated with the alcohol industry with beer and branding and flavors and things like that. And I grew up drinking beers like Lion Red and DB Export. And if we were lucky, we got hold of some Monteiths or some Max, which were beers that had a little bit of flavor. And I suppose back in those days, they were considered to be craft um, beers. But I didn't really, although they were decent enough beers, I didn't really know that they weren't as amazing as beer could be because I hadn't really tasted much else. But that all changed when I went to London. Um, So I very specifically remember going into the Hung Drawn and Quartered Pub in the late 90s in London. And I just ordered a beer I'd never seen before. It was a Fuller's ESB. And I remember from that first mouthful just being absolutely blown away at the flavours and the characters and just how much um, presence this beer had. It was bloody delicious. And I don't think I'd ever had anything quite like it. So it just made me go, wow, this is what beers can be. And I just tried the other beers that I could see in the range. The um, Fuller's uh, London Pride really stands out as another amazing beer. So those two beers, you know, they were they kind of were the gateway beers for me on my on my craft journey, and they would remain to this day on my list of beers to take to a, a desert island. I think you know, full as ESB and London Pride, they're just two of the best examples of that kind of beer. Were those beers uh, available? And I still think they're absolutely amazing. So they kind of sort of took me off on, the, on this journey, and uh, being young and backpacking around the UK and around um, Europe. I just tried as many different beers as I could. And so I broadened my exposure to all these beers and just tried every time I went into a pub somewhere in the UK, I'd see whatever I hadn't seen before on a tap and I'd order that because I wanted to just, just to try as many beers as possible. Not all of them were amazing, but they certainly were more, the, the, the range was incredible and it just kind of got me hooked on the whole, the whole concept of it. And so I went back to New Zealand and there wasn't a lot going on in New Zealand that I found on the beer side of things. Plus I was dirt broke. So I was just buying the cheap beers and that sort of thing. <laughs> but I came to um, Australia in 2005 and the very first beer that I had was a pint of Cooper's down in uh, the Bondo Beach Hotel. And that again, just blew me away that this was a, a really delicious beer and it seemed to be available everywhere. So that was, that was pretty cool. 
And then we sort of went on journeys where we discovered um, little creatures. And that was the first sort of American style parallel that I tried. And it just, I remember just being beaten around by how hoppy this beer was. I think in today's context, although it's still a really delicious and fine beer, it's definitely not as uh, challenging as it was at the time, but that just tells you what else has come up around it over time. But they were, they were sort of the trailblazers, weren't they? And another beer that really got me on my craft journey, um, there's a whole range of beers for the guys down at um, Red Oak. Um, I used to work pretty much around the corner from the Red Oak in the city, in Sydney. And so I'd pop in there all the time. I'd take my friends in there, would go in there on Friday nights. And they're incredible beers, really lovely. And uh, also the Murray's beers. I remember sitting there back when Murray's was at Taylor's Arm and drinking pints of Angry Man, just being really amazed at how beautiful that beer was. And their Grand Cru was the first sort of Belgian triple that I tried. And that was a pretty amazing beer and came in incredible bottles, great artwork, like a really well sort of delivered product. That was really cool. So, yeah, I've just been involved or interested in craft beer for a very, very long time. So your craft beer roots have obviously come from... You know, traveling around the UK and Europe, which I've, I've had other guests on tell us that that's how they got inspired about getting into the, the industry, tasting tasting different flavored beers that you wouldn't get normally over in home. And but you, you've got a bit of a, a home brewing background as well. Uh, I understand. Uh, yeah, able to tell us a bit about your home brewing days. Yeah, I think like uh, just about everybody in Australia starting out in brewing, we end up we start out with uh, Cooper's kits. So I certainly did, you know, kit and kilo kind of stuff, and uh, made some pretty awesome beers from that. Um, and I've moved on to, you know, fresh wort cubes and things like that as well. But the, the real turning point for me was um, I actually had my 40th birthday at Batch Brewery. And before the party, uh, I went into Kristen and sort of said, look, you know, can we, can we brew a beer that we'll end up drinking on the night? And he was very happy to do that. So um, we brewed a, a favorite beer of his called Temperance Brown. And because I'm a bit of a Star Wars nerd, I renamed that to Tatooine Brown. And uh, yeah, basically sort of hung out for them for the day and um, shattered him as he was making this beer. And I'd love to say that it was my beer, but really I was just doing what he told me to do at the right time. But it just got me absolutely hooked on it. I, I had such a fun day and I was so proud to be able to serve that beer and sort of tell everybody in the room that I'd had a small part to play in making it which was, um, you know, definitely under Chris's tutelage. Mm. But what I didn't know when I had my 40th there was that my friends had done a bit of a whip around and had collected a bunch of money and put it to, together for a grandfather for me. So on my 40th birthday, I received a grandfather, and that kind of really kicked me off into home brewing and my, the quality of the beers that I made improved immediately. And so jumping into uh, all grain brewing was absolutely brilliant. So I've kind of adjusted that system a little bit over the years, added a few bits on it, you know, changed the controller and I've got some temperature controlled fermentation now and steel, you know, brew buckets and various other things like that. But it's still an amazing system and I love using it. It's really great. Yeah, I've invested in the Guten, 40 mm. litre Guten system. So it's similar. It doesn't have, you know, all the more sophisticated automation that a grain father has, but it's still that uh, there's many different names, single vessel, brew in a can type, type arrangement. Um, so it does the job, and but having a little one and doing this podcast and the, the, the amount of hours that go into post-production is ridiculous, <laughs> um, I'm finding. So the home brewing side has slipped a little bit, but I do plan once I've uh, got the, the episodes and the, the uh, podcast sort of under control, I'm going to plan to do a lot more home brewing. So... You know, I, I want to take it to this whole new commercial level with it because I love the, I love the feeling of you know making a well balanced beer and you know something that you have followed this process and hit all your targets and then being able to sort of share with your mates after or you know get some some honest feedback from people and and thinking that you know geez I could maybe make a living out of this so it's not as easy as as how I've just made it sound but uh, which I'm finding from this podcast you know and I'm, I'm hoping this podcast series will inspire a lot of people or, or generate that urge to sort of you know they've surely they've all been thinking about it if you're a home brewer there's at one point in your home brewing career you've thought about maybe opening your own so hopefully this will uh, go a long way in sort of gathering all that information and piecing it all together for people to go and do it so who knows we might have a, a massive craft beer resurgence um in australia from it. i hope so but who knows um well i do too, I do too. And I, i've got to just jump in and say look the homebrewing market is incredibly important for us at gladfield mm. you know not only do we see the next crop of brewers coming from homebrew like we've just been talking about um you know we, we 
it's an amazing place for people to experiment. And so we take the homebrew market very seriously. We've got a lot of really great homebrew stores out there. And I would definitely suggest as, um, as brewers make these amazing beers and, and they're serving them to their friends and it's going, wow, this, this is amazing. I could do this. Then, um, yeah, make sure that you work very closely with your homebrew stores because they're all really keen to see folks make amazing beers and sort of take that next step up as well. So, yeah. yeah well, like we were just uh, talking offline, like I know a few people in homebrewing groups that they brew so much they they buy pallets worth of they've actually got malt contracts with people like yourselves and um and other maltsters and it's crazy how someone who's at that homebrewing level can you know have a malt contract and get regular pallets of malt it just blows my mind you know so and i can't recall i think it was dan mccollick and um richard chamberlain when they were on um in an earlier segment they were talking about the uh, resurgence of, of homebrewing because of COVID and so many more people are starting to do it. So yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting because I know homebrewing does spark the careers, but it's interesting to hear also how there's so many people that where they are in the industry now um, on the pro brewing side that never homebrewed in their, their entire lives. So yeah, but I find it's a, nice, a really good gateway into it. It's not definitely not the same, but uh, there's there's some similarities to it and, and definitely a, a good gateway for people. But um, you actually came from the brewing industry before you came over to Gladfield Malt. So are you able to tell us a bit about uh, your sort of days in the brewing industry? Yeah, well, my background actually is in consumer electronics. So I spent a lot of time working um, for computer resellers and then I worked for Sony and then I worked for Apple. And so I spent a lot of time in the corporate world and I indulged in my sort of um, hobby of drinking craft beer and actually sort of doing a little bit of brewing on the side. But we got to the point in my family where my wife's career was really taking off and I decided to take the opportunity to step back out of the corporate side of things and spend more time with my young family. We had two young kids and just wasn't seeing enough of them. And so we just did a bit of a swap and that was awesome, but it gave me an opportunity to think a bit more about where I wanted to go in the future and what I wanted to do. And I was really lucky that I'd met Chris Sidwa through his wife, Tori, um, in my previous life. And I just reached out to him and said, mate, um, have you got anything going at Batch? You know, I'd done a brewing qualification at Ballarat University. So I'd done all the, the, the qualification for the, um, the academia side and was trying to do a bit of homebrew. But, you know, it wasn't particularly good or it didn't have the right equipment, didn't have the time to really invest in it until that point. And... Um, yeah, I just reached out to, Bat, to Chris at Batch and said, um, have you got anything going? And they said, well, no, I don't actually at the time, but you can come in and volunteer for a bit. And so I did. So I started filling growlers and uh, doing kegs and just all, this, all the jobs you do in a small business, which was brilliant because you get to see every facet of a, of a brewery. And I just loved it. I really loved it. And so just over time, that uh, volunteering job turned into a job where I started um, brewing beer for them or making work. Then you made the jump over to the other side of the table where you're supplying malts to the brewing industry. Tell us about how you mm. sort of came with that transition. Well, I think um, like a lot of folks in this industry, we, we all harbour secret ideas of starting up a brewery. And I think you know very well what I mean. <laughs> Since this, is the, this podcast series has come about from that desire. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I was, I was definitely thinking of, of my future. What would I like to do? And I, I really wanted to run a brew pub, actually. And so I thought the best way to, to learn about that was to be involved in a small brewery, which is why I ended up working for Batch. But during that time, I was just trying to soak up as many, uh, as much information as I could and as much experience as I could. And part of that was traveling across to Adelaide for BrewCon. And I'd used a lot of Gladfield malt at batch and just been really amazed at how predictable it was, the, the colour, the flavour, um, the presence of it, just how consistent it was from brew to brew, just hitting your numbers down to the third decimal point once you got your systems dialed in was, was amazing. And so I had this really high uh, opinion and expectation of Gladfield Maltz and I just made it on, on my list of things to do when I was in Adelaide is to go and hang out with Doug and Gabby and sort of create a relationship there because I was expecting to be a customer at some point in the future. And I knew that they were just such personable people. They had such a good reputation in the marketplace. I just wanted to go and, you know, sort of make friends with them, basically. And I did. And then we sort of bumped into each other on and off over the week. Um, and at the end of that week, they gave me a call and said, hey, do you want to come and help out? And I thought that was a, an amazing opportunity I just couldn't miss. So that's how I ended up jumping into, into this role. So I ended up sort of doing a bit of work for Batch at the same time as transitioning into Gladfield and then going full time in Gladfield. And I imagine it, having that stint in the actual professional brewing industry, it's helped you being able to consult and, and develop relationships and 
provide technical advice to brewers, uh, you know, working on the monster side. For sure, because uh, I can talk to the products that we use with a bit of uh, experience and technical know-how, having done it myself and uh, knowing how these malts perform in the brew house. And one of my favorite parts of this job is being invited onto a brew house as brewers and using the malts and providing a bit of advice and just being there as part of it. So I absolutely love the fact that I can sort of straddle um, both the, the, the brewer's experience and coming from the, the supply side, making sure that we match the right products and uh, the right experience there. And can you give us, uh, I guess, a bit of a rundown on Gladfield? Uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people listening are quite well aware of Gladfield, but for those that aren't or those that don't have intimate knowledge of you know, how they came to be and the history within the brewing industry, are you able to give us a bit of a rundown about it? Yeah, Gladfield's been around for quite a while. So Doug is actually a fifth generation barley farmer. So um, they've been growing malting quality barley for a very long time. You know, it's in his blood. And after growing it, uh, malting quality barley for other monsters for a long time, Doug and Gabby decided to, to make the jump and add value to their own product because they knew they could grow this amazing barley. And so the first thing they did actually is to invest in a, in a, um, a lab because they wanted to be able to have every decision they made around making malt come from a scientific um, point of view so they could have incredibly high quality control and also be able to re- replicate that. And so they, they invested in, in a lab and they invested in a uh, malting facility, and um, really high-tech malting facility, and sort of ran from there. Um, so they've got a slightly different approach to a, a lot of maltsters. Um, we have three different varieties, um, one of which is more focused on the distilling side. We've got a couple that are really focused on the brewing side. And we started off growing for ourselves using our own farms. And then over time, as the capacity of the malt house and the demand grew, we've ended up working with a lot of local growers. And we've now got more than 150 growers working with us to grow malting quality barley for us. But we take these sort of two strains and then we use those strains. And throughout the whole process of making malt, we can end up with 40 different varieties. The number goes up and down a little bit depending on what's happening with seasonals. Uh, we do a lot of development for for different trends so for the moment for example the everybody would like to drink hazy pails so we've made some malts that are very specifically for haze retention and beers making that really cool yep. but yeah we, we tend to have around the 40 or so um, all of them available uh in australia we've got four warehouses around here so we're trying to make them available for everybody there are some that are seasonal so they come and go depending on what's happening um, sometimes we do it just because we can and it's fun and it's nimble and other times we've got brewers who ask us specifically for something and we make it for them and, yeah. uh, you know, they might get first bite of the cherry, for example, and release some products around that malt, and then we'll bring it to market for everybody else to use a little later on. So, Hayden, can you explain for the audience, uh, and also myself, because I'm quite eager to know, the process of how barley and malts are grown and processed and ready for use by brewers? Yeah, for sure. I think the, the first thing you've got to start with is a really good growing environment. So Canterbury is actually a maritime climate, which is really important for growing cereal grains. And it means that you get a lot of water, you get a lot of sunshine, um, you get some cold, hard frosts, which is important for barley malt, a um, bit of wind. And uh, yeah, in Canterbury and sort of around that area, at the end of the Second World War, there were a lot of guys that came back from the war and uh, were looking for something to do. So they started doing a lot of big civil works projects. And one of them was irrigation. So there's a lot of um, very big irrigation happening down in that one that was built in Canterbury. And so what that means for us is that all of the barley that we grow is all under spray irrigation, um, all using bore uh, water. So it's really good for us that we don't have the same concerns that other places might do in the world when it comes to um, to droughts and environmental conditions like that. So start off with a really, really good environmental conditions. And um, we have a couple of strains that are sort of more focused towards the, the brewers and then one that is more focused towards distillers. So what we do with the two different strains is it gives us a little bit more resistance when it comes to you know weather and disease and things like that. But we take these strains um, that are grown and harvested at different times of the year, and then we through the steeping, germinating, kilning, and roasting process, we can change any of those regimes to create all the different flavor profiles and types of malt that we do. So if you've got something like a, a sort of a German Pilsner malt all the way through to one of our very dark chocolates, they're actually made from the same original grain. And we blend those grains over the seasons as well. So what that means for a brewer is that um, they can rely on the consistency of that malt performance season in, season out, year after year. And that's how sort of our, our promise with the quality of the, the malts that we make. Excellent. Uh, Hayden, you mentioned uh, that Gladfield produces close to 40 different malts. 
Are you able to tell us a bit about some of the, the different categories of malts? Because I know that there are your typical base malts and then you've got your specialty malts. Uh, are you able to talk around some of the important considerations for all the differences between the two? Yeah, so we grow or we make a lot of different malts. The base malts, they're very um, focused on the, the flavours and characters of other malts that you might be able to buy from other maltsters. For example, our ale malt is very good as a parallel to a Marisota. Provides incredible um, flavour and colour and great extract yield. Um, but we also provide malts that are very specific to different types of beers that you're making. So we make a, um, a German Pilsner malt. Uh, and those base malts are really fantastic for really predictable extract yields, predictable performance in the brewery house and predictable beers and package. We also make a lot of um, more sacrificed malts, and these are malts that um, that are basically lots, uh, a lot of sugars in them, and those turn into our special malts. So we've got um, a lot of crystal malts that we make, and then we take those further using our roaster. We've got a custom-designed roaster that uh, we can produce our dark-coloured malts on as well. I know that uh, with your base malts, you, you, they'll, they'll make most of uh, the typical parallels, lagers, et cetera. But when you start getting into some of the more eccentric beers and all that, that's where a lot of the specialties come into. I know that the base malt will make up most of the grain bill, but you'll you'll end up having a little bit of a specialty in there to sort of give it that little X factor. Is Am I correct in saying that? Yes, I think if you're looking to make a beer that is true to a certain style, then you'll be looking to add certain characters from crystals and from roasted malts and various other things. Yep. Um, there might be beers that you're looking for a very specific flavour to complement something else. So it might be a very specific sort of toastiness that complements something that's happening with your um, hop selection or with your yeast selection. So you would find that um, beers, yeah, the base malt would definitely be a very large proportion of that beer. Um, some beers have a much higher proportion of base malts than others, like a lager, for example, is pretty much all base malt, um, maybe with a couple of tweaks here and there just for a little bit of body and um, flavouring and colour that you're looking for um, to, to distinguish that, that beer a little bit. Um, but um, a lot of beers will have, you know, a small amount of, of um, special malts and crystals and then uh, coloured malts in there. I guess um, you're working around malts uh, every day and, and talking about malts, uh, what you say is your favourite malt and why? Well, I'd say that my my favourite malt is actually our Manuka smoke malt. And uh, the reason for that is that I was growing up, I had an uncle who was a hunter and a farmer and a fisher, fisherman in New Zealand. And so I grew up uh, tasting trout that had been smoked with Manuka smoke, with um, you know eating bacon and venison that had been smoked with Manuka smoke. So for me, it's a very sort of powerful, personal kind of call to a happy childhood. Mm. And I just love that malt. It's, um, it's got a really lovely sort of sweet floral smoke to it. It's not, uh, it's not harsh. It's not camp fiery. And it's, um, it's a pretty remarkable and a very unique thing. It's, um, you, would, you would have definitely have heard of Manuka honey. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out that the, you know, the chips from the Manuka bush are actually really good for smoking lots of different things. And that's why we thought, you know, how would it go if you were smoking malt? And um, yeah, it works really well. And um, a lot of brewers use it. Um, a lot of distillers use it for making Manuka smoke whiskey. Yep. And um, I myself, my favorite style of beer is um, I love big, big IPAs and we make a lovely red IPA using our Shepherd's Delight and um, Aurora and Redback malts. But I put quite a bit of uh, Manuka smoke in there as well because I just love that smoky character. Serve it in a, in a tulip glass so that it sort of holds the smoke in there and you can sort of smell it every time you're lifting the glass up and wafting it around. Yeah. So yeah, this is my favorite style. Is there any big well-known beers on the market that are, you know, do feature your Manuka malt? Uh, there have definitely been a number of um, Roush beers from time to time, but most of the those beers tend to be a bit more seasonal, so I wouldn't say that there's a large, well-known, particularly core range um, beer out there. Um, there are a number of whiskey makers, though. So Thompson, for example, they make a 100% Manuka smoke whiskey that wins all sorts of awards around the world. Uh, so, yeah, we've got uh, a lot of distillers picking that up. Mm. Okay. Um, and is there anything that sets Gladfield apart from other maltsters in the Australian New Zealand markets? Uh, uh, I know that you also, you know, have your sort of, of dip your toes in international markets or international brewers. Um, yeah. What, what, what's the difference between you and a lot of other maltsters out there supplying to the brewing industry? Well, I think uh, you can start with the owners. So we're a family business. Doug and Gabby work in the business 24-7. And when you've got 
people who own the business and work in the business and they're fifth generation barley farmers, they're growing a business for the sixth generation for their own kids. So it's very much a, um, it is, it's a family business and there's a certain sort of you know, connection and attitude that comes with running or being part of a business like that. Another thing would be that we, we control the whole process right from the, when the, the grains are grown and malted and harvested, sorry, harvested and malted, uh, through the roasting and, and um, the entire malt making process and then the way it's packaged and, and, uh, and shipped. So that just gives us an incredible level of control about everything through the entire process. And it means that we have incredibly good controls over the quality. And we're, uh, we're nimble and we're also uh, accountable. So I think our brewers love being able to pick up the phone and being able to talk to us directly and uh, talk to Doug and Gabby, the owners of the business, directly if they want to have a chat about what's happening with the malts or talk about uh, new ideas, how to use them properly, all that sort of thing. We've also got a lab. Uh, so our brewers can come to us directly and, and if, they're, if they're seeing some issues with their beers and they want a little bit of tweaking or they like to talk about what's happening with the COAs and things like that, we, uh, we have access, we give brewers access to that lab. Um, and all of our all of our malts are made from unmodified, sorry, um, no genetically modified grains. We don't use any chemicals. Uh, we don't add any chemicals to the steep water. We don't um, bleach any of the, the grains for colour or to alter the parents at all as well. So our entire focus is very much on consistency and quality with no compromises. Mm. And international markets, uh, I think we were talking offline, uh, there are some brewers uh, outside of Australia and New Zealand that you guys supply to, is that right? Yeah, we do. So we started off just with the New Zealand markets and we've moved into Australia, but we do actually ship to lots of markets around the world. We ship up to China and India. Uh, and we've actually, <laughs> and a little personal win for me, a little while ago, we shipped um, a whole bunch of malt to Fuller's Brewery. So that's oh, a nice yeah. way to sort of uh, to complete the circle there. And they use that in one of their, um, their annual ales. So that was pretty neat having some malts involved with that. And you mentioned that you work with both brewers and distillers and you have particular malts that are more, I guess, leaning towards the, the distillery um, industry. Uh, what, what is the difference between the, the two types of malts? There's a strain that we use for distilling and it's called Laureate and it doesn't contain any glycosidic nitrile. And we think that's really going to be very important in the future because there is a compound in that that when it's used in a distilling process using um, specific um, scenarios and, and production procedures, it can actually be carcinogenic. And that's something I think that will be relevant to industry and government regulators in the future. And it's something that people who are distilling to make a product that's going to be consumed in 5, 10, 15 years in the future, they should know about. So that's one aspect of the strain that we choose that's quite important for distillers. And the other is that we choose those strains for the performance that they have in the way that they're growing. So we want to make sure that we can have incredible yields off the land and have really high quality malting barley, but we're not pushing the land too hard. And when you've got um, a distilling malt like Laureate, where we can have fantastic yields off the land and really big fat corns, it also relates to the alcohol litres per tonne that um, for expected yield that a um, distillery can expect off the malts as well. So you want to choose a malt that not only performs really well in, in the brew house and has a, a very high yield, uh, an extract yield and a predicted alcohol yield, but also tastes really good and is specifically designed for that purpose. So we find that uh, brewers who use our malts, all of our malts are designed and malted for 100% all malt brewing as well. By the way, you'll find that a lot of other malting houses out there, they might be growing or manufacturing their malt for large contracts that go into breweries that are very much focused on um, sort of high adjunct brewing. So that means that their, their callback index might be very, very high. We set ours to between 38 and 42 because we think that's about the right range for people who are doing all malt brewing. So it leaves a little bit of mouthfeel in there. It has fantastic um, flavours and characters, but also it stands up well in package and it's not too hot. A lot of those other malts out there, they're, um, they're pretty overdeveloped, over-modified, and uh, that's because they, they're intended for use in higher junk brewing scenarios, whereas ours aren't. They're, they're focused very much for the craft brewer. And talking about breweries and distilleries, because uh, I've had quite a number of people reach out to me that like the podcast, have been following the podcast, but they're, they're interested in going down the venture of opening a distillery, not a brewery. Because I know the two are, are closely related in terms of, you know, there's an easy transition from uh, equipment and 
we were talking a little bit off, offline about how some breweries are actually starting to do both brewing and distilling. Are you able to talk a bit about you know the sort of growing trend with with that? Yeah, we, we work directly with a lot of distilleries, but we're also seeing that a lot of breweries are starting up sort of the capability around distilling on the side as well, which is really interesting. And we do see a lot of small breweries, if they have excess capacity in their brew house, um, they might have specified a brew house that's way over spec, for example, for where they are when they, when they open, which means they've got additional capacity for making wash. So we're seeing a lot of breweries making wash for small startup distilleries. So there's a lot of crossover happening there. So, you know, brewers having their own capability for making uh, whiskies and uh, for making spirits doing washes for other folks and then folks coming to us directly and having their own distilleries. And what is the, I guess, difference between the two? Like we're, we're talking, there's a bit of crossover and a bit of a transition. And I know that on a home brewing level, like you can have something like a grain father or a guten and it seems to be the biggest difference in equipment is the type of lid that you chuck on the thing. You know, it's, it allows you to, you know, separate the, um, the alcohol from, uh, from the grain. I, am I correct in saying that? Yeah, the, the process is a little bit different to the extent that when you're distilling, you're really after that alcohol extract, that predicted alcohol yield. That's what that's the whole thing you're after mm-hmm. uh, with, a, with a small amount of flavour with it, uh, whereas in brewing, you're really after an entirely different product. You're, you know, the, the, the balance of the, the, the alcohol hops and malt character is a, an entirely different thing. Mm-hmm. They, they get, they're pretty much the same to the point where you're creating that work. It's that it's once the wort's created and the fermenting side of it, the where things change, mm. and um, yeah, that there is different equipment required for extracting the alcohol on the distillery side. Yeah, because you're seeing a lot more talk about distilleries, uh, independent distilleries, um, and a lot of Australian ones that I know that I've been following have been winning some big awards uh, globally, especially for gin. Uh, I know I've seen a, a number of gin distilleries over. Here being renowned as some of the world's best. So it's interesting to see the, that, that growing because I know it's been a big market gin in the UK and Europe for, for quite some time now and it seems to be coming over here now. So, yeah, that, that's been some some angle that I've, I've been interested in covering actually So because there, there is, like you said, a, a bit of crossover. But all right, well, I guess uh, moving on to what aspiring brewery owners need to know in regards to, to malt ingredients. I know that we've talked a bit about you know, some of that already, but... For aspiring brewery owners, what should they know about dealing with maltsters? You know, we, there's been talks about, you know, hop contracts and then also about malt contracts. And what are some of the, the standard malt contracts for the brewing industry and what you would find other maltsters? I know Gladfield has their own sort of look on how they set up their malt contracts and it's sort of like an even playing field like we were talking offline. But are you able to talk us through of what the expectation is with malt contracts with, with breweries? Yeah, I think um, when you're starting out, you're probably going to be doing quite a bit of experimenting and trying lots of different malts and seeing how your recipes will scale and things like that. Uh, we try not to have anything too onerous when it comes to contracts. Um, we have a pretty level playing field. It's pretty much the same sort of pricing for everybody. And so we make it really easy to deal with and we don't have a minimum ordering quantity. So if you want to order one twenty-five kilo bag, that's absolutely fine. We kind of suggest to people that if they're shipping on pallets, they may want to build it up a bit more. So they're, the dollars they're spending on freight per kilo is a bit more reasonable, yeah. especially if you're outside of the metro areas. But for us, really the contract comes down to just a credit account and you don't even need to be on a credit account if you want to come and buy a pallet of malt from us uh, and you want to do that with a bank transfer we can accommodate that as well where it comes the agreements it's more of an agreement than a contract and where that comes into place is if you are expecting an ex- an expectation of malts to be supplied regularly at a certain time so you know, you've got a forecast in place, for example, of these malts at this time, that's what you'd like to see. Or if we're moving into bulk supply, that's a slightly different scenario. Or if we're working in, if we're putting together some malt handling solutions or something like that, or silos and things like that, which we can do, then things change a little bit on that. But certainly we're pretty easy to deal with and you can buy what you need when you need it. Starting out for a new brewery, like you said, they probably haven't got a core range as of yet. They're still dialing in and experimenting. So you'll find that most of those breweries are just ordering what they need at that time, um, what they're sort of, you know, the flavour of the month. But then what you're saying is once they've sort of dialed that in, they've started saying, well, this is one of our best sellers. We're going to add that to our core range. They, you start seeing them, 
engaging with you on a, you know, like you said, a some sort of malt contract or a regular delivery of that malt to complement their production schedule? Yeah, I definitely say as, as some advice to breweries working with any kind of supplier, forecasting is a really helpful thing because then both parties have an understanding of what's required. And certainly with COVID times where there's some uncertainty around freight, it just makes things a lot easier for both sides. If you know, if you're working closely with a partner where the brewer has an idea of what they're producing and when they're going to need their raw materials. If you communicate that to the supplier of those raw materials, it makes life really easy on both sides and then there are less surprises. Um, it's really tough if a brewery puts an order through for something that they need very, very quickly and we can't supply in time for one reason or another, that makes things a bit awkward. We certainly try to accommodate brewers whenever we can for those sorts of things, but take stress out of the situation if, uh, if both parties are communicating on forecasting. And we understand that sometimes those forecasts change, so it, we tend to accommodate brewing requirements as much as we can. And can you give uh, any advice to brewery owners or head um, brewers when it comes to considering malts and recipe design? Uh, you mentioned that um, you know, you've got your own lab. You guys can provide technical advice on someone, brewer says, I'm, I've got an idea in my head of what type of flavour profile or that I, I want to create in this beer, they can sort of consult with you guys, I imagine, on recommending certain malts that you have and, and sort of putting that together in a, in a recipe for them or, or giving them some ideas. Is that how it would work? Yeah, it's a pretty free-flowing conversation. On that. I think brewers have normally got a pretty good idea of what they want to achieve. Yep. And we have a pretty good idea of how our malts will work in a beer. So we just have an open chat, you know, figure out what sort of flavours, colours, characters they're looking for. And... We can, you know, we, we have our own pilot brewery, so we brew with all of our malts as well. So we know really well what they're going to do. We put up on our, online um, a lot of recipes that we've developed ourselves. So brewers going to go and have a look and see how we like to use our malts and how the, the ratios that we use and what's complementary for certain flavours and uh, achieving certain styles. But we get breweries calling us all the time where they're looking for certain flavours and characters and looking for advice. And so that's very much a collaborative conversation. We get breweries calling us too if there's a bit of an issue with one of their beers, if it's not performing in a certain way or there's a certain character they're looking for that they haven't got, then <clears throat> we um, we love talking to them about that because we've normally got something that we could put in there for them to use. Mm. I would say if you're, um, if you're developing recipes, uh, one thing that we see a lot from home brewers, for example, if they're starting to step it up into their own brewery is that sometimes they can bring through recipes that are very complex and they might have 10 different malts and 10 different hops in there. Uh, just have a think about how scalable that's going to be and how um, <laughs> how much you can rely on the supply of all of those components at all times. It's just a fact of life that there will be times when a brewer needs to make small tweaks and adjustments either to achieve something or because uh, they've got an issue with supply somewhere where the, um, perhaps there's a certain hop that's not available or they need to make a beer and they haven't got a certain um, ingredient on hand at that the immediate time you know they, you're gonna to have to be a little bit nimble about what they do so just um try and make your recipes simplified if you can so that particularly on your, on your core range so that you can have some predictability and repeatability in the, the beers that you're making mm -hmm. you don't also want to have 10 different bags of malt open if there's a whole bunch of special malts there you want to be able to use uh, we, we want to be able to keep them as fresh as possible and go through that inventory as fast as you can so having lots of open bags all over the place is um, a bit difficult to manage and very easy to lose track of what's going on. We sort of have an idea of, um, we call it the rule of 25, which is <clears throat> often a brewery where they'll start to simplify their recipes to the point that they're using either full 25 kilo bags or easily divisible parts of those bags. So it might be a half a bag of this or a quarter of a bag of that. So you know that for that one bag of medium crystal, you're going to get four brews out of that sort of thing and so it's much easier to manage your inventory when you when you can sort of split it up like that it's very hard if you're doing 300 grams of that and <laughs> you know small portions here and there that's certainly for your core beers anyway you can take those sorts of liberties if you're doing seasonal beers or collaborations and things like that but certainly as you're designing your recipes and thinking about how it's going to flow through your brewery and how it's going to relate to those beers that are going to keep the lights on you know the ones that you, are your core range that you're going to sell day in day out you want to try and get some efficiencies in that so they're, they're really predictable Mm. And talking about, uh, you mentioned there, making sure that they have like the complexity of certain beers and whether that those sort of malts or hops are going to be available. The Australian and New Zealand malt 
I guess, is getting a lot more interest from international brewers. I, I listen to a number of US podcasts and European podcasts uh, related to the brewing industry. And I hear a lot of them talking about the Australian and New Zealand sort of agricultural industry for, for hops and malt. And is there starting to become you know, a bit of a, a challenge for supply for malt here in Australia and in, in, in domestic markets because of the global interest in, in some of the quality of products that Australian maltsters and New Zealand maltsters are able to provide? Well, I can't talk for the other guys, but certainly for us, what we've noticed is that for a long time, we've kind of been pushing this idea or hoping for the idea that that customers will start to look beyond um, the product itself and actually what goes into the product. And there's sort of a, there's been a movement that we've noticed where it starts off really where the customers are very interested in what kind of hops are going into a beer and they know them by name. They know the regions they come from. And when you get to the pointy end, they know what year <laughs> and what sort of characters that particular harvest of a particular hop is giving off and these sorts of things. And brewers love talking about that. What we've noticed is it's starting to creep into the malt industry as well. So we've get, we get customers now who will be buying a beer from a brewery knowing that Gladfield malt is in it. Or if we do a collaboration with a brewer and we put a little Gladfield logo on there or something like that, or they call us out in the, in the, the description of the beer or the notes on the beer then, uh, you know, customers are starting to become loyal and looking for that Gladfield character, which is really cool. And I think it's just it, this whole sort of COVID um, movement where people are starting to look at where products come from and where the suppliers for parts of those products come from as well. I think people are considering sustainability and local and, you know, they're, they're starting to sort of head down this path where they, they want to know where their products are coming from. And so that's kind of, you know, you mentioned that we're getting a lot of international um, interest in this, and we certainly are. And because there's a really good story around it, so there's a great story plus the, the quality of the products really stack up. Does that mean that we are reaching capacity? Not yet. When I started working with Doug and Gabby, they said they had a 50-year plan for the business, which means that as the we're starting to approach the limits of what we can do with the current format of hardware and manufacturing facilities and so on, then we can expand further. So we can add more germination boxes. We can add more capacity and capability to the business. And so we are not at that point where we're under a particular strain. There certainly are times when we make some malts that, um, you know, there might be seasonal malts that aren't available all the time. And so that may show up where a brewer is used to using a certain malt, but that was the one that we only did for a short amount of time. So we, um, we did some rye malts recently, a crystal rye, a chocolate rye, and a black forest rye. And those three malts were really sort of designed to be seasonal. And they stuck around a lot longer than we originally thought because they were so popular, but you know, they may not be around forever. So that, that, may, that may happen because otherwise you end up adding to your, your product category a catalog and just never taking anything out. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and it's harder mm -hmm. to manage. For us, we've, we've had a lot of interest in our brand and, and where the, the quality of our products come from, but we haven't had our capacity. And we were talking a, a bit earlier, uh, well, I, I'm quite interested to know, because with hops, obviously, they have a, an expiration date, um, being a, a raw material, um, and, you know, malt as well. But what are some of the, I guess, important considerations when storing your malt in, in your brewery? And, you know, what should brewers be looking at in terms of year and, I guess, is the, is the phrase germination date or harvest date of, of when it was processed? Can you explain about some of the quality control around storage of the malts and, and how long they can keep? We sell all of our malts with a best before date on it. And from that best before date, a brewer can expect another year's worth of safe storage as long as the storage conditions are ideal. Mm -hmm. And that really is just cool and dry. Um, so if you've got a hot, humid environment, you know, it's a natural food product. So uh, it's going to be affected, if, especially if the bag is open. If the bag is sealed, then it tends to be in a fairly good environment and it'll last quite well. But yeah, if, you, if you've if you got lots of open bags, as you know, we were talking before about the rule of 25 and the idea of having lots of uh, potentially little open bags all over the place of special malts, that's something just to consider if you're not going through a malt very fast then it will change character over time when exposed to the environment, when exposed to air and moisture. There are some malts that last a lot better than others. Um, so a rye malt's just a very hard corn. It doesn't tend to change its character too much, depending on um, the treatment that's gone through. If it's a smoked rye or something like that, it's a bit different. But certainly as you go further along the mallard chain reaction and get uh, more and more into your special malts or even into especially the roasted and smoked malts, then they will change character faster than others. So you definitely want to be using fresh as much as possible. Um, and that's kind of one of the Gladfield promises is because we 
have our um, farms and malting facility in Canterbury, which is only less than two weeks on a boat. Uh, our malts arrive very, very fresh, whereas malts you may be buying from the Northern Hemisphere might have been on a boat for three to six months by the time they arrive. So they will have changed character during that transportation mm -hmm. and warehousing. That's just what happens with raw ingredients. All right. And with Gladfield being a, a craft maltster, there's much bigger maltster operators in Australia and international markets, but you guys have a, a strong focus on quality and product quality. What are some of the advantages and disadvantages craft malting has over some of the larger malting operators? Well, we are 100% focused on the craft 100% malt beer production end of the market. And so the beers, the, the malts that we make are specifically designed for those beers, whereas other monsters who need to supply to, you know, far larger contracts and far larger or far different brewing environments, they, they may, need, may need to make malts that are more suited for higher junk brewing. So there are compromises for somebody who's making craft beer by using those malts because of their, the way that they've been made um, and the way that they're designed to perform. So for us, uh, we like to make sure that our callback index is, is around 35 to 41, 42, somewhere around there. You'll find that other highly modified malts might be up around the 46 to 49, which is going to, it's a very hot malt then. It's going to perform much more differently in your, in your fermentation and package than malts that are specifically designed to go into to the craft end. And then you've got compromises around uh, sort of quality and, um, and flavor as well. So a lot of those malts are grown to a price point rather, well, made to a price point rather than to um, really exhibit flavors and characters that brewers are looking for. So the other thing that we can do really well is we own that entire process from the paddock through to the package. And so that means that we're really nimble. So we can create all sorts of really interesting malts um, because we can, because it's fun. And we have a lot of brewers come to us who say that they want a particular character or flavor or color or something like that and then i would find that in a malt um, in the market or by the time the malt comes in from overseas it's not exhibiting the characters they want so we'll make it for them that's where quite a few of our development projects come from as brewers asking for certain malts for us to make and we can do that because um because we're small or smaller than the big guys and we can do custom malts for people too so they can come to us and say right i want i want this particular malt and we can make it specifically for them just for them so we've got that flexibility and you mentioned that you've got some growers or 150, was it, growers that uh, are now part of the Gladfield yeah, right, malt, yeah. malt family. So some of those growers, are they all over in New Zealand or, or is there some over in, in Australia as well? All in New Zealand, all in Canterbury. All in New Zealand, right. And do you find, you hear about uh, hop suppliers or hop farms inviting brewers to come to their farms and and check out the process and you know where it's all all made and grown and, and processed is it something similar in the malt industry there is for us yep. so if anyone is listening to this podcast and would like to go and visit the maltings please do let them know you're coming uh gabby and doug are amazing hosts and if you're lucky you'll get lunch <laughs> um they will take you around they'll give you the full tour they'll show you the whole the whole operation it's absolutely fascinating and if you've got the time and make the effort to go and see them, they'll they'll reward you for that. Uh, it's a pretty awesome thing. I've been there and done the full tour a number of times myself, and it's really amazing. I, I, um, the first time I was there, I watched a light crystal come through through the roaster, and I got to reach into this hot milk coming straight out of the roaster, grab a handful of it, chuck it in my mouth. It's like popping candy. Yeah. It's absolutely amazing. The smell of it, oh, yeah. it's incredible. Yeah, yeah, it's a really cool experience. So, yeah, if anyone's listening to this and they want to go and visit the Maltings, please do. I think for the first time when I was doing all grain brewing, I sort of had a little taste of it while uh, during the boil or, or, or when I was trying to cool it down and just tasting, you know, that sort of lukewarm malt, all the sugars that you'd extracted. It was like, oh, I could have that for tea every morning. <laughs> um, just think about how lucky the yeast is they get to go to town on that. Yeah, I know. I imagine. So with the way you just describe that, I'm like, oh, yeah, that that would be something to experience. But uh, that is that is pretty pretty amazing to be there when when something's coming out of the roaster or out of the kiln. Uh, but I love going into a brewery when they're mashing in using Gladfield malt. You know, I just I think you can smell it. I think you can smell the difference in the in the brew house when this Gladfield malt in there is just such a bright, delicious, you know, awesome um, smell. It's it's right up there. I think you know humans respond really well to roasted coffee and to baking mm. bread. And for me, the smell of a fresh mash is right up there with those two things. I think it's amazing. Yeah. I lost a little bit of respect um, for my wife, actually. Uh, 
in the latter days of her pregnancy because um, I don't know if it was some hormonal changes in her and um, it changed the way she smelled things, but she came in the garage in the middle of a boil of one of my homebrew and just thought it smelt like pet barn, you know, it, 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 <laughs> it weird smell. So I was like, you got to be kidding me. This is heaven, this. And I even closed the doors in the garage just so I can soak it all in. So, <laughs> so, so sometimes the aromas of your hop additions can be a little challenging for the uninitiated. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I um, want to get into your industry insights, mate, a bit about, you know, the future of craft in Australia, I guess maybe lean it towards the malt side and beer trends as well. Uh, you know, I've, I've had some guests on the show talk about multi beers might make a comeback. Uh, I know hop, there's a massive hop craze in Australia at the moment, but yeah, I guess just take us through some of your industry insights and what you're seeing um, on the horizon. I think that the is the craft brewing industry here in Australia is so bright. It's just so full of amazing people just chasing a whole bunch of new ideas. The innovation out there is amazing. And the level of quality generally that's out there in the industry, I think is pretty awesome too. It's, it's interesting just watching, you know, a few years ago it was kind of the arms race was all about IBUs and massive West Coast, you know, enamel stripping IPA type beers. And i got to say that's kind of my favourite style. Um, but, and these days people are, are getting an entirely new expression out of hops and using things on, on, the, on the cold side and, it, there's a whole lot of new techniques that are coming out for making beers that people hadn't really thought of about a few years ago. So I think it's really interesting to see the way that uh, everyone at the moment is really interested in hazy pails, um, sour beers are just going gangbusters. So there's a lot of interesting things happening there. And, and actually from the malting side, we are making products that are specific for those kind of beers. Um, so we had one of our favorite brewers in Victoria who make a lot of incredible neepers <clears throat> come and say to us, like, we need, we need something that's all about haze retention and flavor it's got to deliver this sort of beautiful performance and make our beers look like this and and so we developed um we started a, kind of a, an oat development program i kind of call it we started with big o and that is a roasted fully malted oat with the husk on it and so the idea is it's all its purpose in life is about tasting good and having haze retention and hazy beers and because it's still got the husk on it it's like brewing with a whole bunch of rice holes in the in the mash as well so it's really good for water ability and for your extract yield so that's a that's a malt that's specifically designed for haze retention. Um, we've had there's a really interesting part of the the industry um, that's moving into very low alcohol and no alcohol beers, and we had another brewer come and talk to us a while ago about chit malt, which is sort of um, just what, kind of one step up from a malted grain. It's actually quite hard to make, but it is a it's almost like um, using a, a grain as an adjunct, and so it contributes to your fermentability, but not to um, sorry it contributes to your gravity, but not to your fermentability. And it also contributes body and mouthfeel and head retention. So it's full of long chain proteins and sugars that the yeast can't break down. It actually came from the whole Reinheitz Kabot sort of approach where you needed to have effectively an adjunct that was still made from a malted grain going into a beer. So its original purpose in life was head retention and lagers. But we've noticed that that's being used in, in a lot of areas that we didn't see coming. Like uh, it's really good for head retention in sour beers and particularly in, in fruit sours, which is sort of no notorious for having that sort of Coca-Cola head where you pour it and then it just disappears. Mm. So chit malt's really good at that, but it turns out it's really good in low alcohol beers too, because it produces quite good mouthfeel and head retention and a bit of body. And when you, when you take the alcohol out of a, out of a beer, you tend to lose a lot of that. So we're responding to those trends by making new malts that fit in and support brewers as they're heading down those paths. And that's a, an advantage that we have being a craft maltster is that we can respond to that and make products very quickly. Where do we see things going in the future? I think um, hazy pails are going to be around for a long time. But I do think that uh, people are starting to head towards rediscovering malt flavour again. And for a long time, beers sort of some beers have pulled back a bit on the, the malt character as they've been pursuing the hop expression. And I think that balance is starting to shift back a bit now. So I do see my favourite styles of beers, which are very malt forward beers. I start to see them popping up again. And I think that's what's what we're going to be looking for in the future. So not just um, not just high ABV, not just uh, sort of stunt beers and things that are, are very popular at the time, but like a, a bit of a flavour shift into more malt driven beers. Yeah, no, it's interesting that that is where it's going. And I think I've mentioned on this podcast a few times already that, um, you know, Australia's sort of inherited this hop craze. And, you know, I, I, I love love a good hoppy beer, but, you know, I, I think I'm a little bit like Pete Phillip in a way that, you know, I prefer those European-style type beers when, 
you know, it's got a very well, it's, it's well balanced and, and the malt is sort of shining through a little bit more generous bitterness. And there are some great products on the market, but then there's also some that I just think, where's the sessionability in that? You know what I mean? And mm. that's, that's what I think, you know, if I am, am successful with this brewery, I, I'd love to just have sessionable beers where people can, like Neil Cameron says, it's, is, does it pass the pint test? You know, is it is it something you can just have a little sort of midi of and you're just like, yeah, it's good, but I'm not going to be having six of those. Will I buy a case of that? Yeah, I that absolutely is. hear what you're saying about uh, drinkability. The, the brewers at um, Fuller's, I was lucky enough to go and do a tour at Fuller's a few years ago, and they were saying that their, their kind of approach to drinkability is, okay, if you're, if you're halfway down your third pint, are you going to be thinking about a fourth? And so that really sort of speaks to not excessive alcohol consumption. That's not the point. The point is, is this beer delicious enough, interesting enough, uh, an exercise in subtlety to the point where you want to keep coming back for more? So it's not a, you'd find it difficult to, to apply that to a 7 to 9% double dry hopped, you know, oat cream ale sort of thing. But if you think about Fuller's beers, their London Pride is specifically designed for that. It's a lovely approachable beer where you can sit there. It's a lower ABV. It's uh, it's approachable. It's drinkable. You just want to have another one. As soon as you finish that beer, you're thinking about, you know, when's the next one coming in? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I, I definitely think there's a lot of room out there for wild experimentation. And I hope that the industry continues to do that because mm-hmm. there will be some people who have never considered a craft beer would go and <laughs> look at that avocado and go, that's interesting. What else have you got? Yeah, I guess, I guess, um, and you know what, maybe I, I need to be a little bit more adventurous with it. And, uh, but the drinkability is a very important thing for me. And uh, I mean, especially for someone's core range, you know what I mean? Uh, I think, and like you said, it's probably more reserved for the, uh, like a specialty range or a seasonal, you know, or something like that. And they're trying different things. And I guess it only takes one brewery to sort of, pioneer it or try it and then everyone jumps on the bandwagon it just becomes a normal thing so yeah i can i can understand that that sort of angle and sometimes it doesn't sometimes it like a brute ipa it just disappears mm. They're really popular for a while and i actually really thought that black ipas were going to be a really big thing and for some breweries they were for a while but then they just kind of faded um mm-hmm. it's a bit of a shame because i like that style you know i really like the idea of roastiness and hoppiness in the same beer and it, it, you don't need to pursue high ABV and just massive assault on flavor. I think you, when you get the subtleties right for those sorts of beers yeah. and they become really drinkable. Yeah. It's sort of like the, um, the fridge stocker kind of thing, isn't it? Where if, if you look at my fridge, you'll find that there are slabs of pale ale that will always be there from certain breweries where I just, that's where I want in my fridge. Every time I turn around, I want to have one of those beers available. But it's a beer that I can have while I'm making dinner for the kids and now I can drive afterwards. If, and, you know, it's, it's not massively alcoholic. But there are some in there like that, for sure. There are a couple of warheads in there. And I wouldn't buy them by the tray, though. I'd be buying them you know, individually. I love doing mixed four-packs. Yeah. Um, I love the way that, um, that breweries now, you can, even online, you can do mixed four-packs. And you know you, you might have one tray where half of it's going to be their pale ale or, say, a stout or something, or whatever you like to drink. And then you just make the rest of it up using a, a mixed approach. And I think that's really cool. So one of the things that I've seen... Um, with everything that's happening with COVID and a lot of the shutdowns that happened, it really impacted a lot of people's business. And I know a lot of brewers on your podcast have talked about this at at great length, so I won't go into that. But what I see from the supply side, there are more opportunities for smaller brewers to get into into, um, bottle shops than potentially there were in the past, particularly in the bigger bottle shops. So a lot of the big guys, the big supermarket chains have changed the way they deal with small breweries. And what that means is they're getting paid faster. The local um, bottle shop gets to choose which beers go on to the, into their range. And that means they can support a local brewer. And what they'll see is that those beers sell quite well through the bottle shops. And so they can keep that you know, product turn going. So the beers are fresh. They can really see what's selling in the area. And it means that they don't have to range a beer that isn't appropriate for their demographic and then, you know, where they are and what that part of the city or part of the state they're in. So sometimes, you know, in some of the big chains that you, if you're a brewer, you need to be able to supply all of them or you need to be able to supply all of them in a state or something like that. And that might be really hard for a small brewer because they can't produce enough or they can't uh, be sure enough of the quality or they know that that particular beer they're making just won't sell in that area. Um, so I think a lot of those uh, restrictions have started to lift which is really cool. And it means that customers now, instead of potentially having had to go into their local 
pub and just that's the selection they've got and they've got to choose from that now they're going into bottle shops that have got a broader range and they can choose and pick and you know try a whole bunch of new beers they might not have tried before so it's really good for bringing new customers to a brewery the other thing that i've two things that i've seen that have been really advantageous for breweries in these trying times have been those who can pivot quickly into packaged product so if you're a small brewery and you can take advantage of a mobile canning system or another brewery who's got capacity on their canning line <clears throat> or something like that, that's a really big deal for a brewery to be able to move into that. So your, your profit margins, of course, are going to change, but it's, you're still going to be able to sell beer. So if your business is very focused on a tap room and kegs, but you can move into that kind of package product, then you can still continue to sell beer, which makes a big difference to your cash flow. The other thing that I think small breweries really should be very considerate of when they're starting up or even now if they've been operating for a while, how are you going to sell to your customers online? A lot of breweries haven't had that ability and a lot who haven't had it have managed to put together a store very quickly and bang, they can continue to support those customers who can't come into their tap rooms and support them in that way again. So there are a number of breweries, for example, I'm, I'm at the moment, I'm in Port Stevens. And so there's a whole bunch of Sydney breweries that I'd normally buy beer from every single day. And because I don't, I'm not down that way, I rely on them to send me beer by courier and I can buy beer on, online. So I think a, a small brewery, if you can start up an online uh, store, then that's really going to help you. I think in these times, if, if you're a brewery where you can start thinking about, okay, if COVID shutdowns mean that I can't have customers in my brew house again or in my tap room, what does that mean? How do I sell beer? Think about those things, have those thoughts and those plans ready to go so that you can move into it quickly if your scenario changes. I think that's really important. Um, and have a really solid um, social strategy as well. How do you talk to your customers if they're not in your tap room? And it doesn't have to be really slick. You know, no one's expecting it to be the next, you know, Nike kind of thing. But just talk to your customers, learn how to take a good photo of your beer. <laughs> yeah. And you'll find when you put it up there that people come along, they, they tag you on Insta, use those sort of those free social networking tools to try and get your message out there and keep keep in front of your customers and keep relevant. So, yeah, I think that's a, in the past, it's been harder for small breweries to be exposed to a lot of new customers. And I think now it's easier and easier every day. Some great insights there and you know, some that sort of complemented what we've had on the podcast so far, but also some new ones there, which doing this podcast so far and, and even the COVID stuff, doing the Meet the Brewer series, um, it was interesting to hear insights about how breweries had to adapt to to COVID with, you know, pubs and, you know, venues being shut and how quickly they had to yeah pivot to, to package. I think uh, in the news just recently, there's been some, those tax breaks that a lot of breweries were getting on growlers and and all that has sort of ceased so um it's interesting to see how those breweries will sort of go in the next coming 12 months with with those same service offerings because uh, from from memory they were the government had sort of uh, made some tax concessions for not just breweries but but pubs as well being able to get you know a, a growler and all that and you know, some of the, the tax breaks that, that they got for being able to do that. So it's interesting, interesting to see how the industry will, will move forward from that and whether you'll see a slight pivot back to what pre-COVID was. I hope not. I think that we need to work really hard to make sure that breweries are looked after from a tax point of view. I know you've had other folks on this podcast who are experts in this area and, I, and I'm not, but I do see that tax is one of those issues that can kill a small brewery because it just nails cash flow very quickly. And if you give a, a brewery a tax advantage in very tough times, I find it hard to understand why you'd need to pull it back from them to make life harder as soon as things change. It, it feels like we should be encouraging businesses to be more successful, especially breweries, because there's such great wells of knowledge and skills and they employ so many people. You know, a small brewery per litre of, of output produces or employs way more headcount than any of the, the really big ones. So what I'd love to see is a real focus from whatever government uh, functions are necessary for this to try and foster that so the small breweries as they grow have all the opportunity in the world to remain profitable and to employ people and to train those people up because it's just so much more worthwhile and it's good nutrition for the industry. So I think that going backwards and making life harder for a lot of small breweries is the wrong way to go. So this is something that, you know, there's big challenges in the industry around those sorts of things. And there are lots of guys out there who are really working hard to for the, the mutual benefit of everybody in this brewing industry to try and change those things. 
same can be said for for council approvals you know i had a chat with you recently where we were sort of talking about a lot of the um the difficulties that small brewers have when starting up their brewery and getting da approvals and various council approvals so things they're trying to do can be tied into restrictions that are quite rightly require um, required for much larger facilities and so some of these small breweries have, have got the are under this um onerous obligation of having to comply with some of their rules that are appropriate for the bigger ones but maybe not so much for smaller ones particularly for breweries that are in locations that are sort of semi-industrial or um, brew pubs and things like that so those sorts of things um, there are a lot of people out there who are pushing very hard in the industry for advocacy around those and i think finally uh people are starting to listen on both sides and i think um hopefully we'll see the health of the industry continue to grow as it's much more viable for people to start up businesses and remain healthy and employ people. Yeah, absolutely agree. And you mentioned a bit about some of the impact COVID has had for your type of industry in terms of the supply side, freight being one of them. You want to talk a little bit about some of the COVID impacts? Yeah, so what I've noticed is that our customers overall, our business is is still growing really well, but the mix of those customers can change a little bit, has changed a little bit, particularly on the homebrew side. Like the homebrewing market is really going gangbusters. It's fantastic. Um, what has happened for anyone who is moving any product internationally, and it's not just Australia or New Zealand or any other country, it is the global freight network is under a strain that is never seen before because of all of the flow on effects. It's a very complex world out there for, for international freight. And what we've seen ourselves is that there has been pressure on just the sheer number of vessels moving around. So boats that have come down from the Northern Hemisphere and come through Singapore, for example, there might be port strikes that have affected their ability to port somewhere else, which means they miss some of the ports and various other things. It's a pretty complex thing. We think we're pretty much through that now, but you're in the conversations I have with brewers, when they're waiting for hardware and steel to come in, they might have ordered a whole bunch of tanks, for example, that are expected before Christmas and now projected to be running six months late. This is a very common conversation. So, you know, heavy industry in China has been affected, moving um, moving things around, canning lines coming out of the US where there are components that have needed to come from other places. Those components have never arrived, so they've never been completed, all these sorts of things. So for us, yeah, it's been really frustrating with some of the the pressure that's put on the supply network, but we're not alone. It's, it's affecting absolutely everybody. Well, I do appreciate you taking some time, Hayden, and uh, I um, I didn't realise we'd be able to talk that long about malt. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's an important important ingredient at all like i said this is going to form part of our raw materials or ingredient supply segment which uh, i think is a something that you know people may not know a, a wealth of, a, about so it was good to sort of get your um, insights about malt handling the different types of malts out there some of the technical advice and consulting advice that you offer to, to other breweries when it comes to their recipe design and and some of the industry insights as well very interesting there to add to uh, i guess some of the other podcast episodes we've had um about about the industry but any any closing thoughts and advice uh you'd like to sort of leave with the audience yeah i'd say that um malt is the soul of the beer and i think if you really invest in the absolute best ingredients you possibly can raw materials then it only goes to improve the the performance of your beer and just how delicious it is how sustainable it is in package how easy it is for, for the brew house to use those materials and all that sort of things so really don't cut corners uh, on your ingredients really sort of um, invest in making the, the absolute best beer that you can and, and then you know charge your customers accordingly for it i'd also um, just like to point out something around sustainability so um, we as a company take sustainability really really seriously and a couple of things that we've done recently is we've shifted um, our malt packaging away from having a lined bag into a single layer that means that we've reduced our plastic can, um, use by 50 percent and the plastic bags that we are producing now that the malt is in are actually recyclable. They're all color coded too. So when you're in a brewery, you can see just what, what um, malts you have up on the racks. It's really easy to see what's up there. Um, and on sustainability, we're actually moving as a company towards a, a new initiative that we call Going Green. And our goal is to reduce 95% of our carbon emissions around production within 18 months. So there's a lot happening there. And for customers who are really interested in knowing that their suppliers are taking sustainability and stewardship of the land really seriously, then it's something that we can talk to them more about because it's incredibly important to us as well. 
Excellent. And if anyone listening or, or even people in the industry that require malt or advice around malt, how can they best reach you, mate? Well, you can jump onto our website, which is gladfieldmalt.co.nz, and you'll find a wealth of information there, information on all of our malts, a lot of recipes, um, a bit about us and who we are, and also contact details for myself and for any other resellers you're looking for. So if you're looking for homebrew stores in different states and different countries, then you can find all that information there. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks again, Hayden Lockie, for coming on the Build Me a Brew podcast. Been a pleasure. Thanks for the chat. Thanks for listening to the Build Me a Brewery podcast. That was part one of the raw materials and ingredient supplies segment. Part two of the segment, I meet up with Michael Capaldo from Hop Products Australia to discuss the hops aspect in the commercial brewing world. As always, if you are liking the podcast so far and find the content useful, please give us a follow and rating on whatever platform you're listening on. Also, follow us on all our social media handles, as well as visiting our website, www.buildmeabrewery.com.au. And much more complimentary content will be coming your way if you sign up to our mailing list. I'm Chris Hayton, your host, and this is the Bill Me A Brewery podcast.